afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Liu Qing. I'm a cardiologist at Kalmet Hospital in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. First of all, I would like to say that I'm delighted to welcome to all to the 25th AFCC virtual meeting under the topic of challenges and conundrum in echocardiography. To begin, I would like to express my gratitude to co-chair Professor Ling for helping organizing this event. Professor Ling is an associate professor at the Department of Medicine of the Yonglu Lin School of Medicine, National University of Singapore, and Senior Consultant of Department of Cardiology for the National University Heart Center, as well as the National University Hospital Singapore. He is also a visiting scientist at Mayo Clinic Rochester and Mayo Clinic Scottsdale, Arizona in 2002 and 2003. Visiting fellow at, he is also a visiting uh, scientist at Mayo Clinic and the University of British uh, Queensland in 2003. Fellow of Academy of Medicine Singapore in one, uh, 1997. Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians uh, Edinburgh in 2000. Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeon Glasgow in 2001. And a Fellow of Academy of Medicine Singapore. Next, let me share with you a brief introduction of the significance of echocardiography in Cambodia. As we all know in Cambodia, echocardiography play an important role in diagnosing illness. Echocardiography allows doctors to perform a focused cardiac ultrasound on any critical ill patient to help with diagnosis guide management. Research so that emergency physicians who are able to master the basic skill of cardiac ultrasound can quickly diagnose many potential life-threatening pathology in patient and sufficiently improve patient care in resuscitation scenario. So without further delay, let me hand the stage to Professor Ling. Professor Ling will tell you more about our speaker for today. Please welcome Professor Ling. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Liv Chin. And uh, we are very privileged today to have a illustrious panel of uh, speakers. Um, in the interest of time, I'll introduce everyone briefly. Our first speaker is none other than uh, Professor Yerun Bex, uh, who is a professor of cardiology and director of non-invasive imaging at Leiden University Medical Center, the Netherlands. We all know him as a, a, a very recent ex-president of the ESC. Uh, he has served on many guidelines committees, uh, written books, and he's also an associate editor of uh, uh, of what I feel is one of the most um, important portals for uh, clinical medicine up to date. Um, Professor Bax really needs no introduction, and we are very honored uh, to have him talk to us today about an emerging uh, area in cardiovascular research, which is moderate steno aortic stenosis. Professor Bax, please. Can you hear me well? Yes. 
Well, thank you very much for uh, your kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I, um, I put it a little bit broader. So I put it here, difficulties in aortic stenosis. So I'll cover quickly um, two other case. I start with two cases and then we go to moderate aortic stenosis. I think it's a little bit more comprehensive. And um, yeah, it's a pity we cannot be together, but like this is also not so bad. Okay, let me see if I can move my slides. Yeah, so this is uh, the slide that everybody always shows when we talk about any valve disease and particularly aortic stenosis. You see here this work from Nokomo, which I think is really beautiful from the Mayo Clinics also. Um, and it's uh, about 12,000 patients and it shows with the aging population that we start to see more and more degenerative heart disease, heart valve disease, mitral regurgitation mostly and aortic stenosis. I'm going to start with these two cases, which I think is always intriguing to talk about is this difficult situations, aortic stenosis and heart failure. How do we diagnose? So this is the low flow, low gradient situation. You have an aortic valve area that says there is a severe stenosis and I have a gradient says there is no severe stenosis. So if you talk about severe aortic stenosis and heart failure, initially I always thought I never see these patients, but these patients probably were not referred to either surgery or we did not discuss them or we did not pay attention, but we looked in our database and 35% of the patients with severe AS have a depressed ejection fraction, have a low float states and have a low gradient. So it's not just something that we never see. I'm gonna just take two cases. So this is a 73 year old man, 2003, one infarction, conservative treatment, 2006 angina, and a, a low ejection fraction, 20%. Angiogram, three vessel disease. Uh, he has bypass and ICD. Current symptoms is he get more and more dyspneic, now New York class three. Comorbidities, kidney disease, as you see there, and the logistic euro score is 42.6%. This patient will never, ever, get surgery. So what can we do? Aortic stenosis and LV dysfunction is a difficult situation. Here you see the pictures. Pictures are not ideal. Here, this is one. This is also the reality that we often see. But what we do see, we have an ejection fraction less than 40. We have an aortic valve area that we calculate one point centimeter square. And we have a mean pressure gradient less than 30 to 40. So the valve does not open, but the pressure is relatively low. So then the question is actually very simple. Is it the valve that doesn't open or is this ventricle not strong enough to open the valve to pump out the blood? So this is what we call this low flow, low gradient situation. And you see here, very simple, classical low flow, low gradient. We challenge them with dobutamine and to see if the valve area stays low. So the valve stays closed. And as a consequence of a ventricle that starts to pump more and more, that the gradient goes up. That's a true severe aortic stenosis. Okay, so we do that. Here you see the baseline and you see the peak, uh, the butamine, 20 micrograms, of course, not higher. So mean gradient, as we measure it at that time is only 20 and the aortic valve area indexed for body surface areas less than 0.6. If we challenge him, the valve stays closed because it doesn't do anything and the gradient goes up. That means that this is a valve disease and not a ventricular disease. This is one of those. Now, sorry, what happens most often, however, is that the valve area doesn't do anything and the gradient also doesn't do anything if you do this to butamine challenges. And that is why we use nowadays this because most of these patients are being worked up for transcatheter heart valve replacement. So we do a calcium score. And if you see this patient with lots of calcium in all these tips of the leaflets, then it must be an aortic stenosis, right? Then the cutoff values have been introduced, cutoff values for aortic valve calcification burden to define severe aortic stenosis. So men more than 2000, women more than 1200. I think it's important as a clinician that cutoff values are just an indication and always use your clinical judgment. Because if this patient would have had a calcium score of 2000, 
in my opinion, he would still be a severe aortic stenosis, right? Even if he didn't make the cutoff. And that I think is the problem with cutoffs, that they're good, they're good to have, but at the same time, we should think about that they're just cutoffs. Okay, I'm gonna go to case number two. This is a 57 year old female. She has atrial fibrillation. She has catheter ablation in 2004, coronary disease, right coronary a little bit, 60 to 70%. She's obese and she had breast cancer in 1984. She has surgery, chemo and radiotherapy. And her symptoms are dyspnea class two and she's in persistent atrial fibrillation. Here is her ECG, relatively rapid AF. And these are her pictures. Ejection fraction, 36%. And here you see, not so much on the valve. Here you see the uh, turbulence over the valve. And this mean gradient is 14 and the aortic valve area is 0 0.6 centimeter square per meter square. So my gradient says no severe uh, stenosis. My valve area says, mm, this is severe aortic stenosis. So what do we do? We do again the dobutamine. You see here the baseline. Pictures are certainly not ideal. Here you see the dobutamine challenge, 20 mics. And this is what we see then measuring. This again is the baseline. Mean gradient 14, valve area 0.57. If I give 20 mics of dobutamine, my mean gradient becomes 20. So it's still not a severe aortic stenosis, it stays low. But my valve area is significantly improving. It's now 0.72. So this valve starts to open when we give the dobutamine. I've given you two cases. And then this one is a pseudo severe because the valve opens and the gradient stays low if I give dobutamine. So this is a ventricular disease and not a valve disease. But again, I highlight most of the patients, you just do a CT scan and you see how much calcium there is. This um, low flow, low gradient is a difficult one and there are many more uh, variants of it, but I think it's good to always think about that if we talk about aortic stenosis. Calcium score, as I said, is so important because it's easy to do nowadays and it gives you these scores and it tells you immediately what's going on. This is of the lady and you see that she doesn't have much calcium. She got a score of 900, which doesn't make the cutoff for severe aortic stenosis. Okay, then I'm gonna switch now to moderate aortic stenosis. What do we know about moderate aortic stenosis? We know that moderate aortic stenosis is associated with impaired survival compared to a matched patient cohort without moderate AS and preserved left ventricular ejection fraction. So we're talking here about preserved ejection fraction. There has also been published recently that patient with LV systolic dysfunction and moderate AS also have a relatively high event rate. So this changes the whole field basically of aortic stenosis because we always talk about severely calcified stenosis and now all of a sudden with high gradients and small valve areas and now all of a sudden we start to think about moderate AS. How did we get to this? Well in Leiden we have a um, ecosystem which is um, digitized in 1990. And there was two places in the world where they started at such early stage digitizing. Dr. Ling knows that because in Mayo, they started very early with digitizing and we started digitizing very early. Why? Because uh, Netherlands is very close to Norway and Norway is where that came from. By then it was called Vingmet, these ecosystems. So since 1990, we got all the patients digitized and the patients in the Netherlands, Netherlands is just like your country in Singapore, small country and people don't move much. If you move 25 kilometers away, then we say here, hmm, you're moved far away. We're not gonna see you much anymore in the future. So this gives you an idea that the patient don't move. So the follow-up of patients, we have a lot. And so when we went back and we started to look at this moderate aortic stenosis, we indeed saw that a lot of these patients had not good outcomes. 
So this is the, page, the paper from De La Salle in uh, Jaha in 2019, and it shows moderate aortic stenosis in patients with preserved ejection fraction and their outcomes. Here you see the line of identity. And this is, this is the expected survival for these patients over so much period of follow-up, 72 months. And this is what really happens. So they have a relatively poor survival. At 72 months, 50% of the patient is dead. 500 patients preserve the F, mean valve area 1 to 1.5. And if you compare that with a match point, match population, you see that they're very, very much lower than what they should be. So they die. Question is, do they die of this aortic stenosis? That's a difficult one. And that is what I will um, lead you through a little bit. So this is the work from Jeff Strange. They built in Australia this huge database of patients with uh, aortic stenosis. So in total in this database is 200,000 individuals, more than 18 years, 50% male, 50% female, so a nice balance. And they have 25, thousand plus individuals with any grade of aortic stenosis. So 10.7%. And if you then look at these patients here, these are the moderate AS patients. And this is the mortality at five years. So you see that this is not a benign disease, same as what we will show you in our database. If you look at this uh, survival curves over 16 years of follow-up, this is, let's say, normal patients with basically no relevant aortic stenosis. The green one is the mild aortic stenosis. And the purple and the black are respectively moderate and severe. And you see that they're actually quite much the same. They're not very different. That put us on the track that what about this moderate aortic stenosis? How relevant is that? So we worked together with Singapore, with your university. And we combined patients. This is the work from Amanula and um, Siwi, where we looked at 1,300 patients with moderate aortic stenosis defined as an aortic valve area between 1 and 1.5 centimeters square, follow up median of 4.3 years. We look at mortality, mortality, stroke, heart failure, and myocardial infarction. Before we go there, I'd like to bring another concept to you. Why is this moderate aortic stenosis important? And why is it that we should not just look at aortic stenosis, but once aortic stenosis develops, it's what we just spoke about, the low flow, low gradient. Often ventricular disease happens. So following aortic stenosis, myocardial damage occurs, and that goes gradually. And the aortic stenosis will have consequences on the left ventricle, but not only the left ventricle, also once the ventricle starts to dilate, there will be mitral regurgitation. A lot of patients with aortic stenosis eventually develop some form of mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation will have influence on the left atrium. And then if that gets worse, if the pulmonary pressure starts to go up, it will have influence on the right side. If the pulmonary pressures go up, right side dilates and tricuspid regurgitation occurs. And this is the concept of staging the aortic stenosis disease. This was put forward for the first time by Philippe Genereux. I was uh, by then associate editor for European Heart Journal and I got that paper and I thought this, this is a completely different way of looking at aortic stenosis because we're always thinking, oh, that's a valve, we should focus on the valve, but it's more than that. I put it like this, we published this in The Lancet um, in 2019. If you have an aortic stenosis, that valve does not open, then this ventricle has to work harder and harder and the ventricle will get hypertrophied and eventually the ventricle will start to dilate. When that ventricle starts to dilate, this mitral valve will start to no longer close completely. Pressure overload, will result eventually into some uh, severity of mitral regurgitation. When that happens, the left atrium starts to dilate. When that happens, atrial fibrillation often occurs. That's why many of these patients have atrial fibrillation, pressure overload and volume overload. <clears throat> and then what happens, this disease starts to spread to the right side. 
what's going to happen is actually that uh, pulmonary hypertension, you see the RV dilates, pulmonary hypertension and eventually tricuspid regurgitation occurs. RV dilatation and pulmonary hypertension and tricuspid regurgitation. This is the concept of staging, that it's no longer just a disease that we see only on the aortic valve, but spreads to the whole ventricle. So if we take a look at this cohort that we have, we see in patients with moderate AS that there is already damage. Patients in stage zero, they have no cardiac damage. This is about 200. Stage one, there is left ventricular damage, hypertrophy, dilatation, 350. Stage two, have left atrium or mitral valve damage. That actually occurs in 560 already. <clears throat> stage three is the pulmonary vasculature or tricuspid damage in 130 and stage four is the RV damage in 100. So the vast majority of patients is here, LV damage, LA damage and mitral valve damage. So a little bit of mitral regurgitation, left atrium dilated, pressure and volume overload and atrial fibrillation. If we look at these mortalities for these different cohorts, this is the stage zero, 22.5. But this is the stage four, with the very uh, spreading to the right side of the heart, 64% over five years. And if we combine mortality, stroke, heart failure, and myocardial infarction in this moderate AS, we see that this is 30% and this is 94% in total cumulative. So my conclusion is, based on this, moderate AS is more frequent than we thought. Event rate is high over time eventually mortality will be high. So should we intervene when the AS is still moderate? And how do we do that? Should we select them by staging, seeing how much damage there is? So I can tell you that we started this, uh, this trial with Edwards. That's called the PROGRESS trial. It's just launched. And uh, that's going to include a huge amount of patients looking at moderate AS, treating them with transcatheter heart valve versus the patient being treated conservatively. Thank you very much for your attention. I think I'm within the time limits and it's a pleasure to be with you. And I look forward for the rest of the talks, listening to you and then sharing with you the questions. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bax, uh, for sharing your insights uh, with us in this uh, challenging uh, setting. Um, we got to get used to uh, uh, considering aortic stenosis as sort of like a more comprehensive uh, condition than just a valve itself. Our next speaker will be um, uh, Dr. Chun Lei, who is a cardiologist at Kalman Hospital in Phnom Penh and also director of the Chun Lei Clinic. He uh, specializes in heart ultrasound and valvular heart disease. And today, uh, we are very fortunate to uh, be able to hear him speak about a condition that obviously is becoming more common in the in, in clinical practice, calcific mitral stenosis as opposed to rheumatic. How do we assess severity? Dr. Chun Lei, please. Uh, welcome to uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, Welcome to Cambodia today. I'm uh, very happy to talk in our uh, 23rd AFCC conference. Uh, today, my talk is about calcific mitral stenosis. And sorry, my slide not uh, move. Yeah, today my talk is um, uh, calcific mitral stenosis. Uh, like, as you know, the mitral stenosis is uh, frequently caused by rheumatics and calcification. Uh, it's uh, by contusion of uh, bicommissural. Like uh, our practice uh, long times ago, conventional to the echocardiography, has widely used to uh, determine the smallest area. However, 2D echocardiography is uh, still very limited today to uh, select some patient for uh, mitral 
of percutaneous microvalvuloplasty. So now the 4D echocardiography is a very important uh, role in the uh, diagnosis and uh, uh, quantification of the severity of the mitrostenosis. This is uh, the way we do in uh, practice every day. Normally we can see the mitral valve uh, based on uh, the new echo today and the new software, we can look very clear. The uh, mitral valve and uh, uh, subvalvular apparatus. By the de definition, when we talk about mitral stenosis, when is a uh, mitral valve surface area is uh, inferior than uh, one or point five. This is a. Uh, This is a uh, called the classification of mitral valve. Most of the mitral stenosis normally is uh, uh, more than ninety percent caused by rheumatic uh, mitral stenosis, and uh, mitral classification we can see much of the older people, and uh, especially in the Western country and like in European and in USA. You can see in the uh, mechanism of the mitral stenosis. This, uh, this uh, uh, graphic, you can see the, in the diastolic, the pressure gradient of the left ventricular and the left atrium is uh, nearly uh, 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 zero. When you have the significant mitral stenosis, it do create the gradient between the uh, left atrium and the left ventricular. And you can see the based on the mitral stenosis and its uh, a physiopathology, you can see the mitral stenosis is the uh, pathology of uh, uh, pulmonary and the uh, the atrial fibrillation. So the most of the complication of the mitral stenosis can uh, create the uh, of pulmonary hypertension and the high heart rate, uh, right heart failure, and also cause the atrial fibrillation and the thrombus in the left atrium and cause uh, uh, ischemic stroke and uh, very frequently. Based on the natural history of the mitral stenosis, we can see all the significant mitral stenosis, the life expectancy very short after they have the symptom of the NIHA 4. So in this uh, natural history tell us uh, we should select the patient uh, uh, for the for the surgery or the for the percutaneous mitrovalvuloplasty when they have the early symptom. This is the way that we always access to the severity of the uh, uh, mitroval classification on the parastagna long axis, we look very clear the mitral valve and in the M mode, we can see the, uh, the classification and we can measure the sickness of the valve leaflet. And this is, uh, we can look the, in the parastagna long axis, we can see very clear the mitral valve in the mitral valve stenosis, we always see the uh, anterior uh, valve is always like the, the hockey. And we also, because uh, of the new uh, software of echocardiography, we look in the multi-D at the same time, we can 
C in mitral valve at the long uh, axis and the short axis. So we can look very clear in the uh, bicommissural that we can indicate the patient to do the uh, MPV or no. It is a, 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 a parastagna a, a long axis. We look in the three chamber. It's a very important. We can uh, a calculation of the sub uh, valvular apparatus. So we can look very clear. The patient has a classification of the mitral valve or sub uh, uh, sub ovavular apparatus or no. This is a four chamber. We look very clear the open of the uh, interior and posterior leaflet. You, we can see the classification and also we can estimate the, the severity of the uh, mitral valve stages. That means that mean we can estimate the uh, surface valve area by measure of the interval of the two uh, interior and posterior valve. It is uh, the way that we measure the uh, direct measure of the planimetry. And also we can see the classification of the valve. It is a, a 40 light echocardiography. We can see the, the classification of the mitral valve and the other associate of the uh, valve disease, such as uh, optic valve disease, we also can see. And this is a, a short axis. We look in the 4D life, we can see uh, very clear about the, uh, the mitral valve and the, its uh, bicommissural. This is uh, the case of the severe mitral valve stenosis. We look in the uh, 2D echo, we can see the classification, uh, uh, but we, we, are, we are not very clear of the, of the uh, mitral valve surface area. In here, we look in the 4D uh, 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 of the short axis, we can see very clear the uh, mitral valve surface area and the classification is the case that we cannot do the uh, percutaneous valvuloplasty. It is that the way we measure the, the surface uh, valve area by the uh, 4D echocardiography. And this is, uh, we look in the uh, color Doppler and also the uh, 2D, we can see the smoke in the left atria and indicate this patient could have the thrombus uh, in the left uh, atrium. And this is, uh, we also look in the uh, color floor and we can see the severe uh, mitral stenosis. In the assessment of the uh, classification of the mitral valve in Cambodia, before we used to use the uh, 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 Comier score because this is a friend uh, method. Uh, before our heart center, we have the backup by the uh, uh, friend organization. So uh, all other French doctors, they prefer to use the Cormier score. But after we have the, the Wilkins score is uh, more clearer then because we can uh, look into the uh, four important point to assessment of the severity of the classification of the mitral war, like uh, mobility, and the sickening of the wall and the calcification. And we also see the subvalvular sickening of the uh, uh, subvalvular wall. So according to the uh, uh, Wilkins score, we can uh, grade the uh, four grade. 
that means the grade one, grade two, grade three, and grade four. According of all of these grade, we can uh, we can estimate the patient. Uh, we can do the percutaneous uh, mitral balloon valvuloplasty or no. Normally, in the whipping score, if the score is less than eight, that means we can predict the patient can do the uh, PMBV. After the, we access the classification, uh, some case of the patient, we have a difficulty in the uh, direct uh, uh, planimetry. So we can go back to estimate the severity of the stenosis by using a pressure gradient. Normally in the pressure gradient, we can uh, do uh, according to the new, uh, the uh, very sophisticated of the uh, mitral valve, so we can uh, measure the uh, mitral valve gradient. In the atrial fibrillation, we can uh, sum four, three or four of the mitral valve gradient together, and we take the mean, so we can estimate the mitral gradient. And after that, we can estimate the surface uh, valve area by use the pressure half time. So that's, that is the second method that the valve is uh, 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 very classified. So we use that uh, method. And then we estimate the pulmonary uh, systolic pressure. So in the uh, classification of severity of mitral stenosis, we classify the mirror is according to the surface valve area and the pressure half time, mean gradient and pulmonary systolic uh, uh, pressure. So we can uh, classify of the mere moderate and severity. According to the, our new Babylon uh, guideline in uh, ESC 2011, uh, they recommend uh, the patient in uh, mitral stenosis the first of choice, we should choose the patient is uh, suitable to do the PMCs or no. If the patient is uh, very difficult, uh, cannot do the PMC and re they, we return to the uh, uh, surgery. So some case, the contraindication for the PMC is uh, when the mitral valve area bigger than 1.5, if has the thrombus in the left atrium, and the modern uh, mitral valve regurgitation. In this uh, algorithm of the ESC guideline, this is a very important for our practice in mitral valve disease. We should find the symptom of the, if the patient have the symptom, we will assessment the patient valve is suitable to do the PMC or no. Yeah, if, uh, if no, we look into the patient has a high risk or no. The, the best way to try the patient to, for the treatment of mitral stenosis, we, we treat the patient to do the P, PMC first. If the patient cannot do the PMCs, and we go back to do the uh, open heart surgery. In conclusion uh, of my talk, the rheumatic mitral stenosis is still the highest prevalent heart disease in developing country and underdeveloping country, especially in Southeast Asia and in Africa, especially in Cambodia now, we still have in uh, mitral uh, stenosis, is uh, rheumatic heart, what, mitral stenosis is the high F prevalent in valvular heart disease. For the classification stenosis, we see in the industrial country, in the people all age, and the Western country and European and USA. Conventional 2D echocardiography has uh, still a limited to select a patient for the PMC. The 4D echocardiography, according to the new system, as new machine and the new software, they can uh, use, uh, they replace the role of the uh, CT scan or MRI. So we can choose the patient to do the uh, PMC. 
early diagnosis and assessment of the mitral stenosis to avoid the complication of the severe pulmonary hypertension and atrial fibrillation that lead the patient to have the handicap and the entry table. Thank you for your kind attention. That is my talk. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Chun Lei. Um, we will be leaving questions uh, to the end. Um, and thank you very much for sharing us uh, with us your experience in uh, mitral stenosis. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Uh, Amliana Sasanto. Uh, she is a uh, cardiologist uh, and associate professor with the uh, University of Indonesia. And uh, uh, she is attached to the non-invasive diagnostic unit of the Harapan Kita National Heart Center in Jakarta. She will speak today uh, on the uh, challenges of uh, using EOVE prime in diagnosing LV diastolic dysfunction. Mill, please. Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to this uh, wonderful event. And for the next perhaps 10 minutes, I'm talking about diagnosing left ventricle diastolic dysfunction, limitations of E per E prime, and I have no disclosure. In 1997, Dr. Nagy and group introduced a new parameter E per E prime, which reported to have a good correlation and agreement with wedge pressure measured invasively. The index has been validated in some clinical condition and recognized as a non-invasive marker for estimating feeling pressure. It has a central role in some diagnostic recommendation for evaluating the left ventricle diastolic function, either in patient with normal ejection fraction or in patient with reduced ejection fraction or abnormal cardiac condition. Most recently, uh, European Society of Cardiology recommendation also placed E per E prime in the scoring system uh, for diagnosing HFF, together with other Doppler parameter and strain in functional domain. However, E per E prime is not a super parameter. Nothing is perfect. There are reports recognizing a limitation of E per E prime as a diastolic function measurement in some condition. A recent meta-analysis evaluated some echocardiography indices to estimate left uh, ventricle filling pressure invasively. Uh, regarding to our topic, I only took E per E prime force plot and we can see here that there are a wide range of correlation coefficient in various cardiac condition. This shows us that E per E prime is not always correlates well with left ventricle filling pressure, especially in certain condition. Just a bit about E wave and E prime wave. We know that E wave we got that from mitral inflow velocity and it represents LA-LV pressure gradient in early diastole, LV relaxation and LA-V pressure. And E prime wave, we get that from tissue velocity at mitral annular site and it represents left ventricle relaxation and filling pressure. Both parameters are preload dependent. Uh, since E per E prime is a composite index, any condition or to either parameter could affect the ratio. So uh, we are going to talk about the limitation of the E per E prime, and I will decide uh, the, divide it into two things, it's technical factors and physiological or clinical factors. I'll start with the technical uh, factors. Since these parameters follow the Doppler principle and we use pulse wave Doppler, uh, so there is sample volume with specific size and location. Uh, we put the sample volume for E prime at the mitral annulus medial and lateral, and for E wave at the tip of the mitral valve. And uh, of course, it is angle dependent, so we have to get the most parallel jet with the ultrasound beam. An op optimal gain and filter is important to avoid measurement under or overestimation. It is recommended to average 3 bits in sinus rhythm and 6 bits 
or more in atrial fibrillation. Several cardiac conditions can reduce the accuracy of E per E prime for predicting the left ventricle filling pressure. My talk will be emphasizing in a more practical aspect here. E per E prime has a limitation if applied in mitral valve disease. We know that uh, in mitral regurgitation, significant mitral regurgitation, there will be an increase of E wave velocity and it is used as a marker of severity. The study reported only modest correlation between E per E prime and wedge pressure in mitral regurgitation and no correlation uh, in a patient with mitral stenosis. But other studies showed that secondary mitral regurgitation, the E per E prime had uh, quite a good correlation, while in primary mitral regurgitation, it does not. In mitral annual calcification, there is a study showed that E per E prime showed only modest correlation to left ventricle filling pressure. And they compare it with uh, mitral E per A in IVRT, which has uh, a better correlation. Uh, but if the calcification is mild, or we measure the uh, segment that is less affected, for example, in anteroceptor, the correlation will increase. Uh, when we try to distancing the sample volume from the uh, max site, Unfortunately, E per E prime continued to perform poorly. What about in aortic valve disease? In patients with aortic stenosis, E per E prime shows a good correlation with the left ventricle filling pressure. But in patients with aortic regurgitation, we can see from these pictures that the aortic regurgitation jet can interfere with the mitral inflow velocity. There are limited data on accuracy of estimation of left ventricle filling pressure in patients with chronic aortic regurgitation. In patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the predictive power of E per E prime was poor in the observation of individual patients. In uh, the medial E per E prime over 15, the LA pressure can be uh, ranged from 5 mm mercury until 40 millimeter mercury. And if we move to the lateral E per E prime, there is only a modest correlation with uh, mean LA pressure. In patients with coronary artery disease, the E prime reduced at the infarct segments. And the E per E prime was unreliable for predicting rates of filling pressure. Uh, this is the correlation depend on the site of sample. In patients with a stable angina, E prime also showed only modest correlation with left ventricle filling pressure, especially in patients with one vessel disease and preserved ejection fraction. In pericardial disease, there is, uh, we know that there is a respiratory variation of the E wave velocity, while the E prime velocity is higher at the septal than uh, in the lateral annulus. Uh, there is a study here, I think Prof Ling is one of the author in this study. Uh, they show that there is a positive correlation of E prime to left ventricle filling pressure, causing inverse relationship between E per E prime and wedge pressure. Uh, you can see in this uh, picture here that patient A have E per E prime only 5, but uh, wedge pressure uh, 30 millimeter mercury, while patient B have E per E prime 17 and have uh, wedge pressure 18 millimeter mercury. What is the performance of E per E prime in patient with heart failure? In HFPEF, a meta analysis comparing E per E prime and invasive left ventricle filling pressure, and they conclude that the correlation was poor and high E per E prime index showing a good specificity but low sensitivity. While in patients with half ref, an average E per E prime has high sensitivity and specificity for wedge pressure over 15 millimeter mercury and the relationship is more certain 
in patients with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, on the contrary, there are another study uh, reporting that the correlation is highest in the in individual with normal or only mildly impaired systolic function and the correlation reduced in those with uh, reduced ejection fraction and poor in those with ejection fraction less than 30 uh, percent so it's quite conflicting of course you cannot rely on one parameter there are other doppler parameter that can be used or incorporated to assess the diastolic function or to estimate any increase of left ventricle filling pressure uh, doing the SAFA maneuver to see e per a changes can be useful or detecting any l wave from the mitral inflow or looking for the differences between the a wave from the mitral inflow with the A reversal wave from the pulmonary vein or calculating the IVRT and seeing the differences of E to E prime onset and you can use it with uh, the IVRT over T uh, E to E prime and propagation uh, flow velocity uh, also can be used. I just want to say that we can refer to this guideline to help assessing the left ventricle filling pressure in a special condition. Again, there is no super or perfect parameter that can fit to all condition. A comprehensive, comprehensive assessment is needed uh, to evaluate the left ventricle diastolic function and assess the left ventricle filling pressure. This is my last slide take home message. E prime is a robust marker in the prediction of left ventricle filling pressure, but nothing is perfect. Many situations can affect this value, so E per E prime should be interpreted with consideration. No single index robustly reflects diastolic function and hemodynamic condition, so use the algorithm that incorporate multiple indices. In evaluating the diastolic dysfunction, clinical findings, 2D echocardiography data, and multiple Doppler measurements should be incorporated. If there is still in doubt, invasive measurement may be needed to confirm the left ventricle filling pressure. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Susanto, and uh, for a very comprehensive overview of the uh, challenges of using EOV prime in clinical practice. We will leave the questions to the end. And our last speaker uh, for today is uh, Dr. Barakaf Badusha. Uh, he is um, a consultant cardiologist presently practicing in Lamwayi Hospital. He has been, I think, uh, practicing in Penang for quite many years. Uh, he is uh, a very um, uh, a very uh, popular speaker in this region, and uh, we are very uh, privileged to be able to have him share some thoughts on LV non-compaction, which uh, clearly causes uh, uh, confusion uh, a lot of the time for both uh, uh, doctors and patients. Uh, Dr. Barakath. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ling. Um, uh, it is indeed an honor to be here today uh, in the AFCC. I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to speak today. Um, I've been given the task of talking about left ventricular non-compaction, clearing the confusion. Well, uh, I do not have any disclosures for this presentation. Uh, left ventricular non-compaction cardiomyopathy is defined as a rare genetic cardiomyopathy. And uh, it, it, it can present itself uh, without any LV dysfunction or with LV dysfunction. And it's usually characterized uh, by excessive prominent fabrication associated with deep recesses that communicate to the left ventricle. Because of the prominent trabeculation, uh, you would be able to see a bilayered uh, 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 anatomy on the echocardiography. Uh, the compacted field will be the normal uh, thin LV myocardium and uh, trabeculation will be the non-compacted uh, field. Now, it has been classified uh, uh, by the American Heart Association as a genetic cardiomyopathy, 
whereas the ESC and WHO has, have classified uh, LVMC as unclassified uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, the reason why there is a difference is because uh, there have been cases of a sporadic LVMC. So I think uh, for us to label everyone with LVMC as genetic cardiomyopathy might not be the, the, the right way to go. Uh, the way we diagnose uh, LVNC cardiomyopathy is usually by echocardiography. Transthoracic uh, echocardiography tends to be the uh, mainstay of uh, imaging, mainstay imaging tool for us to diagnose LVNC. In cases uh, where we could not get good echo windows, we could consider uh, contrast echocardiography. Uh, in this part of uh, the world, in Southeast Asia, I think contrast echo is a bit difficult. Uh, most centers do not use it, use it. So occasionally we might have to revert to cardiac MRI in order to diagnose this group of patients. Now, these are some examples of my patients with LVNC. On your left, you could see a patient with normal LV systolic function. Uh, the trabeculation tend to be commonly seen in the epical region. Occasionally, it can be seen in the mid-inferior and mid-lateral ball, and most times it's past the septum. You could see a compacted uh, LV myocardium that is thin and a non-compacted uh, LV myocardium filling the left uh, ventricular apex. In this patient, the LV function was normal. On the right, you could see another patient with LVNC. Here, we could see the deep recesses in the left apical region, and there is this non-compacted uh, segment uh, involving the lateral wall and a very thin uh, compacted uh, uh, normal myocardium. And in this patient, uh, you could notice that even though the ECG, you can't see it so well, there is some form of intraventricular conduction defect. With, uh, this is another case. Uh, this is the real life scenario. Uh, in, 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 in patients where, in this patient which presented with uh, LV uh, systolic dysfunction, there was a suspicion of LVNC, uh, but we were not so sure. So we didn't have any contrast. So we had to revert to a cardiac MRI. And in the, in the cardiac MRI, we could see the, the compacted and non-compacted tissue uh, myocardium very well. And it is well uh, seen in the short axis. Now, what are the areas of confusion in patients with LVNC? The first confusion is usually uh, the question of whether this condition is pathological or physiological. And the reason for this is because um, this abnormality is also seen in uh, athletes and also in pregnant ladies. In some studies, they have found that 18.3% of uh, athletes do have hypertrabeculation and fulfill the criteria for LVNC, even though the LV function is normal. In some patients, uh, uh, in some ladies who are pregnant, this abnormality is also seen. And it is also seen that after the pregnancy, it reverts back to normal LV myocardium. So it's, it's always uh, a bit difficult uh, when you see a patient with hypertrabeculated LV, uh, apical LV, and you're suspecting LVNC, you need to always consider whether this could be a physiological finding uh, before uh, uh, embarking for more further imaging uh, te uh, testing. Now, there are a couple of ways to differentiate normal variant and LVNC. Patients with LVNC usually have symptoms. They have family history. They have abnormal ECG. They tend to have some T-wave inversion there, bundle branch block. They almost always have some diastolic dysfunction. Uh, on exercise, they tend to develop a poor LVEF. This is a good test, especially in patients who have normal EF at rest. And uh, usually, they have abnormal strain, uh, abnormal delayed uh, gadolinium enhancement on CMR, and and if you if you if you, if you take a history in depth, they tend to have a family a member who have similar features. Now the confusion number two uh, is it a distinct pathology or a morphologic variant of other pathologies? The reason for this is because LV uh, apical hypertrabeculation or LVNC abnormalities are also seen in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. It's also seen in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and also other cardiomyopathies. So there is an overlap of this pathology that is seen in other cardiomyopathies. And this is because they originate, the abnormality originate from the sarcomeric gene that is also associated with this condition. So you, you wouldn't be surprised if you see a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy with LVNC configuration on the echocardiography and also in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
In fact, if you look at the gene mutations in patients with LVNC, it is associated with other cardiomyopathies such as dilated hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and even in ARVC. It is also associated with a lot of congenital heart disease and also arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies. Among patients with uh, uh, LV, uh, this is among patients uh, uh, who are diagnosed uh, congenital heart disease. Is, I mean, in patients with congenital heart disease, it seems that 30% of them do have LVNC abnormalities. And the congenital heart disease that usually have these abnormalities are the VSDs, ASDs, and also the Epstein abnormality. So this is an adult patient of mine who presented with heart failure. And I think it's quite obvious that he had uh, apical hypertrabeculation, which fulfills the criteria for LV and C on the four chamber and three chamber, and also on the short axis view. So if you see a patient like this, the next thing that you need to look for is concomitant cardiomyopathies and also congenital heart disease. And that is what we did for this patient. And when we looked for congenital heart disease, he was also noted to have an ASD. So it's extremely important that uh, we remember that patients we, who have morphological changes suggestive of LVNC, we need to look for other concomitant Ill, uh, cardiomyopathies. We need to look for congenital heart disease. Now, the third confusion uh, is basically the diagnostic criteria. There are so many diagnostic criteria for LVNC. There's the Chin's criteria, Jenny's criteria, Stolberger's criteria, quite a number of criteria. It doesn't really matter whether it's echo or MRI. But what is important is most of these criteria um, were, were created based on a small number of patients. You could see that in uh, the chain criteria was based on eight patients, the Jenny criteria was on seven patients, uh, the Peterson CMR criteria was on seven uh, patients also. So the reproducibility uh, of these criteria, uh, which were tested in many studies, the, reproduci the reproducibility seems to be very poor. And there is poor correlation within these criteria. In fact, in some studies, it was found that these criteria uh, tend to be oversensitive, especially in black patients who have uh, typical LV apical trabeculation. So the fourth confusion is basically the natural history and prognosis of this LVNC. Uh, nobody knows how to treat LVNC. Uh, if they have heart failure, we treat as, as per guide, uh, heart failure guidelines, uh, so studies have found that patients with LVNC with poor LV function, less than 50%, they do worse than those who have normal LV systolic function. In another study, uh, looking at all uh, uh, meta-analysis of all patients with LVNC, they found that besides the LV systolic uh, dysfunction, the presence of delayed enhancement on cardiac MRI predicts the prognosis. Patients who have poor LV function and on top of them, uh, on top of that, having delayed enhancement on MRI, uh, they have poorer prognosis compared to those patients who don't have any abnormalities at all. So how do we approach a patient uh, with all the confusions that we have? I think we have to uh, uh, look at the patient as a whole. If you do an echo, which is the, tends to be the first investigation uh, among patients uh, who present to our clinic, and you suspect the patient is having LVNC, and the next thing that you need to look at is at look for red flags, basically heart failure. If you have heart failure with trabeculation being present, then this is most likely LVNC. If you have uh, LV uh, trabeculation on top of a normal LV systolic function, but the patient has typical ventricular arrhythmias that has been found on his Holter or ECG, we could also diagnose this group of patients as LVNC. And even those patients who have thromboembolic stroke uh, fulfilling the LVNC criteria, you could also call this group of patients as having LVNC cardiomyopathy. The, the problem comes when you have LVNC abnormalities on echo MRI, and yet they do not have any, any, any red flags. Basically, they have a normal LV function, they have normal ECG, normal Holter, they are asymptomatic. What do we do with them? If they have positive family history, maybe you might need to ha have a surveillance uh, echo probably within six months to a year. If they do not have any positive family history, then you can leave them alone. So in conclusion, I think it's extremely important when we uh, look at imaging findings suggestive of L LVNC, it should be interpreted based on the clinical context and not only the anatomy. 
If you see the anatomy of LVNC, you need to look for other uh, abnormalities, concomitant uh, cardiomyopathies or congenital heart disease. If you do not see any concomitant cardiomyopathies or congenital heart disease, then suspect isolated LVNC or physiological cause, causes uh, that could be the cause of the abnormalities in the LV apex. Presence of isolated LVNC warrants detailed scrutiny of the LV systolic function. We know that LV function being poor in this group of patients uh, is basically a poor prognostic indicator. And in some cases, you could go ahead and do a CMR and to look for delayed enhancement in order to prognosticate the patient. This is my last slide, and I thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Baraka, for uh, another very uh, concise and clear uh, lecture. So we will open the session to uh, questions Q&A now. And we are very pleased to be joined uh, at this uh, last segment uh, by the two local cardiologists uh, from Phnom Penh. Uh, we have Dr. Sakan Solida who is deputy head and cardiologist or at the Priya Kosamak Hospital in Phnom Penh, and also Dr. Lim Yekskrung, uh, who is also a cardiologist from the same hospital. So, um, so we have a, at least a couple of questions here. The first is uh, directed to Professor Bax, and this is uh, from Dr. Richard Ng. And uh, he says, um, is moderate aortic valve stenosis now, is it mandatory for patients to have a TAVR or AVR or SAVR now? Um, with the observation that we often intervene too late on patients. Uh, thank you very much for this question. And um, um, I answered to him already through the chat because I thought that it was directed to me through the chat. But um, um, no, this is this is not uh, the issue, no, because we, we don't have any evidence really in moderate aortic stenosis. That's why we're doing this trial. There is some observational work um, coming from um, the different uh, large uh, centers showing uh, what I just showed to you with uh, Jeff Strange from Australia, what we did in the Netherlands. Netherlands, there are a couple of other places in Rotterdam, they did something and um, they all show the same more or less. But what we need is a randomized control trial uh, to see if that's going to really work. And that's what the trial is going to show. So for the moment, uh, we do not um, um, send patients with moderate AS um, for a uh, transcatheter or surgical intervention, unless you have other clinical reasons to do so. But in practice, um, moderate AS is not an indication um, to, um, to treat the valve at the moment. And just to follow up on that question, um, we do see in some series that the, uh, these patients uh, often don't have a very high aortic valve replacement rate on follow-up, but they, they are clearly at risk of mortality and they, they, they are, um, perhaps they die more often. Is that, what do you think exactly is the, the underlying reason for this uh, mortality? What, what is it that does the patient in, if not the valve, or is it the valve? Yeah, that's very hard to tell. That's a very good question. And basically, nobody really knows that. If we look at severe aortic stenosis, basically, it's the same observation. We never know really what a patient dies of. And um, we started to operate on these patients because we believe that it's the valve that's eventually creating the problems. It might well be that further... Um, uh, development of severe aortic stenosis eventually results in LV dysfunction. And a lot of patients die of complications of that, but nobody really knows what the patients truly die of. That's a good point. That's something that we've also been considering. The only reason to, uh, the only way to find out if there's benefit of a valve uh, treatment is uh, to do the RCT, which we are doing. Right. Um, there are, of course, other questions uh, for Professor Bax, but I will, I will go to the next question here, which is for Dr. Susanto. Um, 
the evaluation of diastolic dysfunction in patients with atrial fibrillation is generally challenging. Do you have any tips to overcome this issue? Can atrial fibrillation directly affect LV diastolic function? Thank you, Prof. Ling, and thank you for the question. Uh, is my voice uh, clear enough? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I agree that uh, evaluating diastolic dysfunction in patients with atrial fibrillation is very challenging because of the uh, variation of the RR interval and the variation of the uh, velocity. Um, well, there are other indices uh, to evaluate the uh, diastolic function in atrial fibrillation. For example, you can use IBRP or you can use the acceleration time from the uh, diastolic uh, pulmonary vein uh, diastolic velocity or you can even uh, measure the uh, uh, acceleration rate of the e wave um, about e, e prime it doesn't mean that you cannot use it but you may use it with cautiously and uh, the guideline they said the um, cutoff is different from the other condition it's uh, equal or more than 11. Uh, diastolic dysfunction and atrial fibrillation, I think it's just like a chicken and egg. It can uh, be the cause or the, uh, it can be cost or it can be the cost. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for our speaker uh, for an excellent presentation. I have a question to uh, Professor Bax for aortic stenosis. And how do you assess the severity of aortic stenosis in case the patient also have a severe mitral regurgitation? As you know, uh, mitral regurg regurgitation may reduce the uh, mean gradients and also the uh, LVOT stroke volume index. So how, what is your approach? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very important one. Um, I don't have a good answer for that because nobody has. So what we usually do is we stick to the rules as they are in the guidelines. So valve area gradient and the inter, um, the complete picture of those things. But um, once there is severe MR, that is a difficult situation. I have another question uh, to Dr. Santo. Um, in case the patient have uh, mitral valvular annular calcification, can we use E to E prime ratio to estimate the left ventricle filling pressure? Or you, uh, what is your approach to estimate the left ventricle filling pressure? Thank you. You're muted. Okay, MAC is the condition that we uh, cannot trust E per E prime very well. But there uh, is a study that uh, use E per A and IVRT. So there is an, uh, a nice algorithm about that, about uh, how we evaluate the left ventricle filling pressure first by E per A. If you have E per A less than 0.8, it means that you have a, a lower left ventricle filling pressure. If it is over 1.8, it is high. But if it is in between 0.8 to 1.8, you may use IVRT. I think that's a, a good algorithm to evaluate the LV filling pressure in patients with mitral annual classification. Can I ask? Uh... Can I ask Professor Bax uh, with regards to moderate uh, aortic stenosis, the grading of moderate aortic stenosis uh, based on left atrial dilatation, pulmonary pressures, uh, the right ventricle. Now, the problem with moderate, I mean, a lot of these patients are elderly patients and they might have left atrial dilatation for other reasons. Uh, sometimes they have diastolic dysfunction, uh, they have hypertension, and uh, sometimes they have AF, uh, which uh, causes the dilatation of left atrium. So how do we grade, um, I mean, the severity of moderate aortic stenosis in this group of patients? 
Yeah, so we, we keep the, the definitions, as we said, according to valve area gradient, etc., that we have. But what I tried to show is that all this collateral damage, so to say, can occur already at relatively early stages uh, in aortic stenosis disease. But it's not that we use that to, um, to make the diagnosis. This is more like a picture of the total damage that can happen. Now, the point that you raise is also very good because you cannot differentiate, of course, that these collateral damages that occur in aortic stenosis, that they, in this specific patients, are occurring because of the aortic stenosis. So it can happen, but it's not always that it happens. And you're absolutely right that you can have, let's say pulmonary hypertension because of another disease that is uh, creating this problem. What we have seen only in these big databases in the ones from, uh, from Australia and also the one from us is that when you um, look at this aortic stenosis patients that they often have, uh, you, can, you can put them in this sort of uh, different categories that I indicated. But um, you can never 100% sure say that the tricuspid regurgitation is because of related to this aortic stenotic disease. It can also be that he has a problem in the right ventricle. That is um, always important to realize. So in all this um, analysis and uh, disease classifications, there's always this sort of problems because we can, even, even if you f classify, for example, mitral regurgitation severity, there's always concomitant other diseases. Um, and that um, makes the things, of course, more complicated than they are. But at the end of the day, you need to find a practical way of working and then you just classify that, taking into account that it's never 100% precise, maybe not even 70% precise. Yeah. I think it's, it looks like this is a sign of the times that when we are doing our ward rounds, these patients have got aortic stenosis, uh, COPD, uh, diabetes, and all that, and all these comorbidities, uh, you know, if we just disregard them, uh, they do weigh into, uh, that's why we have the Chelsea comorbidity index. All of these things weigh together, result in a poor outcome for the patient, and they may not just be the valve alone. That's the, the problem. Yeah, and that's very hard to differentiate eventually what kills uh, who, right? And yes. that is that makes if you look at any mortality study, um, it's very hard to say that. We we look uh, for the moment um, a lot on these new heart failure drugs, and then the focus is heart failure rehospitalization or myocardial infarction or cardiac death or whatever. And you can ask each time for every. Uh, patient the question yeah is he gonna die because of this disease or does he die of something else and that is really difficult i think we will never get clear answers of that that's why most of the studies eventually only focus on all cause mortality where you can ask lots of questions if this is real if this is the best way forward or not but at the end of the way yeah, it's a sort of practical approach but what i said about the severe aortic stenosis um, is the same you never know if they die on the consequences of that aortic stenosis. That's why I showed you this sort of staging thing, which is theoretical, of course, but in a lot of patients, it happens like that. If we leave them alone uh, without intervention too long, they will eventually get this uh, co-problem, so to say. But if they die of this or this specific um, um, abnormality, yeah, it's very hard to say that. Yeah. If you look, for example, eh, you take the severe heart failure trials, do patients die of that heart failure or do they die of any other cause? It's very hard to tell because when you have them in your hospital, sometimes they die of, uh, let's say, a sepsis secondary to that. Still is a heart failure patient dying in the trial. It's very hard to make these specific distinctions because the, when patients get sicker, all these things are sort of coming together and then separating out um, one detail is very, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, Professor Bax, you told us about this calcium scoring thing. Um, mm -hmm. I have a patient who had uh, mitral valve replacement for rheumatic valve disease many years back. She's got severe symptoms now. The aortic valve looks significant on the echo but we did a right heart cath and the wedge is normal at rest. And the peak to peak gradient is only 16. So should I do a calcium score uh, on this rheumatic valve? Does it, does it uh, apply? 
the mm. same thresholds. That's also a difficult one. I don't have a really clear answer for that. Did you exercise the patient, see what happened? Yeah, she actually did the wet uh, in increase significantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, probably it's related, but it's hard to say uh, that it is specifically that cause, but probably it's related. We have this study ongoing, which is called a V-Wave study. And the V-Wave study is uh, patients with end-stage heart failure, um, where we do a shunt between the left and the right atrium to unload. Um, and you can do that in severe uh, reduced ejection fraction, and you can do it in uh, severe preserved ejection fraction. Both of those patients can have problems with that. And if there's nothing else that you can do, uh, then you can put this shunt, um, just a simple shunt, simple tube, a little tube between the left and the right atrium. And we often get into these problems that we don't know what it, uh, what it is, that uh, is it a resting situation and we stress the patients, we often see then the wedge going up and then it's a clear situation that something is happening. I think in this, on all these sort of diseases that we start to see, as you say rightly, they are so complex because patients are not just one disease. They are a compilation of lots of uh, imperfect situations. And then what we do, yeah, we put eventually, if patient come with chest pain and we have some indications, we put a stent. But to really show that it's this problem that's creating that, that uh, symptom is very hard. So eventually you have to make it simple, practical, and then that's what you do. Thank you. And That's what um, we do every day in life, right? I mean, yes. we, we, we simplify it, but we, we see with this aging population that there are so many problems often. Yeah, and then we treat one and we hope that that's going to help a little bit. Okay. Any other questions from the panelists? Yes, thank you don't... all the participants and uh, speaker for your wonderful uh, presentations. There's two questions to uh, Dr. Barakat. You have presented about the left ventricular lung compactions. So uh, does the right ventricular lung compactions can be coexist with the left ventricular lung compactions? And inside your cache, what is the prognosis of, of the patients? And the question number two is you have uh, highlighted that the one complication of the left ventricular lung compactions is ventricular arrhythmia. So uh, does the ICD may prolong the survival uh, period for, for the patient? Thank, thank you. So yeah, so so uh, that in fact, if you if you look at the at the, at the first case that I showed uh, with, with the normal LV systolic function, the LV in NC was uh, the right RV apical was also involved. So occasionally you do see uh, hypertrabulation in the right apical uh, segments. But the problem is, you know, even in normal patients with normal LV, you tend to see a bit more hypertrabulation in the in the right apical ventricle. So it's really difficult for us to, to, to see that this is worse. So, but in the setting of LVNC of the left apical segment, and then you see a lot of trabeculation on the, in the right apical, there's probably an, an involvement of the right ventricle also. Uh, there are no cutoffs, there are no studies uh, looking at how much of trabeculation in RV is considered as RV, uh, RVNC. We don't know. Uh, but we know that in patients with LVNC, they can have RVNC also. So uh, that is, and, and their prognosis is much poorer compared to those who do not have RV involvement. Uh, as, as for your second question with regards to arrhythmias, now, uh, like all cardiomyopathies, if you diagnose the cardiomyopathies, they are always at higher risk of sudden cardiac death due to arrhythmias. Uh, but what are we going to do uh, to find out if they are at higher risk? Well, I think the most important thing is the, the, the LV systolic function. I think if the LV systolic function is low, I think they are much higher risk of sudden cardiac death. And in this group of patients, I think AICD is indicated. Uh, there have been studies in uh, patients with LVNC with uh, LVEF of less than 40%, and they found that these patients benefited from AICD. But these are all small trials, so we do not know. Right now, we still based on uh, the current heart failure guidelines. Uh, we look at left bundle branch block, all those kind of things, and then we decide. What I do in my clinical setting is basically I do holter, uh, uh, usually yearly. But if, if the holters are normal, sometimes I look at the, the family history. If there, there had been history of sudden cardiac death in the family, uh, 
Uh, and on top of that, you have a strong family history of LDNC or other cardiomyopathies. Sometimes they have dilated cardiomyopathy in the family and you see a LDNC in the other family member. You have to understand that the genes that are causing all these cardiomyopathies are pretty much the same genes, the sarcomeric genes. So, so in, in this kind of situation, uh, even though it's not evidence-based, I, I do suggest uh, the patient to consider an ICD implantation. Uh, thank you so much for your answer. I have another question to Dr. So Zenta. Uh, you have highlighted that in the case of pericardial effusions, the ratio of E on E prime is inverse. So in such a case, uh, do you have an approach to evaluate the uh, LV professor? Thank you. Oh, uh, Mel, I think that's directed to you. I think she can. Uh, can. Can you maybe repeat? I'm not sure whether she heard you. Yes, I have one more question to Dr. Su Susenta. You have presented that in the uh, case of pericardial effusions, the ratio of E on E prime is in inverse to the normal. So uh, in such a case, do you have an approach to evaluate the LV? and presser, thank you. Think that think that might be issue with uh, connection. Um anybody want uh, any any of the other speakers want wants to help with that? So uh, the assessment of LV filling pressure in somebody with uh, pericardial disease is the question, I think. So the um, so the 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 situation that. Uh, Dr. Sosanto brought up was uh, constrictive pericarditis specifically. Um, I think there is some dispute about uh, about this um, analyst par paradoxes, uh, whether or not it um, it is applicable to uh, all patients, and um, I think particularly from the Cleveland group, um, there are there some of their studies suggest that you actually can. Uh, get some idea of the LV filling pressure uh, from the from the E over E prime, but one of the things that I think it's useful to look for is the um, it, or, already in the setting of constriction, uh, the uh, and and in most pericardial diseases that the L, LA pressure is high, um, so you get a you get a high uh, E wave. But also sometimes it's useful to look for the that what we call the L prime wave, and I think that L prime wave does suggest to us that this mid diastolic flow does suggest to us that the uh, LV filling pressure is elevated, uh, LA pressure is elevated. I don't know whether we have lost we have lost Dr. Susanto. I think now we are already out yes. of time. And uh, I would like to thank all our speaker and uh, for excellent presentation and fruitful discussion. And once again, I want to thank uh, Professor Ling to help to organize uh, this event and thank all uh, AFCC organizer. I think it's time to end so uh, thank you very much thank you thank you thank you also it was a great pleasure thank you very much thank you very much bye-bye <laughs>